coming to you from London in Bethnal Green in my studio, as you can see behind me. Um, and I want to thank Hospital Rooms for having me today and for anthropology support too. Um, I really appreciate this and I really enjoy holding these workshops. So thank you very much. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about my practice and the types of things I think about when I'm making paintings before we started. Um, I do a lot of drawing some pencil sketches and watercolors and things. And I think a lot about the landscape. And lately I've been thinking a lot about our relationship to the land and plants and um, flowers and things that are um, going extinct or are struggling to thrive. So I do some watercolor sketches before I start just as kind of like a warm up exercise. And I so there's lots of reference materials that you would see if you were here um, that are on the walls all over the place from different plants that are now extinct to things that are still um, in existence. Um, this is actually from my home state of Illinois. I'm from Chicago. Um, so I look at mushrooms, I look at plants, I look at trees, um, I look at patterns and things in nature. And then I make up a landscape that might be from things that don't exist today and that do exist today. And I also look at other work by artists such as Helen Frankenthaler's piece. This is called Mountains and Sea. So I'm kind of thinking about this in particular today. Um, and I thought I would share that with you. And then I also think about my color choices. So I thought I'd go through, um, as I set up my palette over here, I've got um, lots of different uh, colors today, but you can really mix whatever you like and work with a lot fewer um, colors than, than I'm gonna put out today. Um, I do a lot of blues because I thought I would think of today's landscape as being a view maybe from the sea. Chicago is built on a really big lake and one of my favorite things to do is to lay on my back floating on the lake and you look up and you can see the skylines and it's kind of like laying in a canyon of buildings around you. So I thought today, um, also thinking of Helen Frankenthaler's piece that I would set up um, my palette and think about making a shoreline and a seascape. So I'm gonna lay out all my colors. I also have a little trick that I do with um, tape to keep my paper stable on the board so it doesn't move around when I'm working because sometimes I can be kind of aggressive with it. I learned this trick from an artist named Woody Othello and I put a piece of tape upside down underneath my paper and leave it sticking out. And then I'll take tape that goes over the top of that. And that way I make these kind of corners and that holds my paper down so that when I'm moving around, my paper isn't going all over the place and you can paint to all the edges. So if you wanted to do the same thing as well with yours, that's what I really use the, the paper for. And so once I've got my paper stabilized, I'll start thinking, the other thing I do is I use a medium. And a medium is something that, you know, with watercolor, or I'm sorry, with acrylics, you can thin them with water, but you also can thin them with something called um, a medium, which you may or may not have there. And if you don't have it, you can just use water. But what I use is something called pouring medium. And this, makes the paint more fluid. And I just put it in a little pot here. It makes the paint more fluid. And it also, um, unlike water, it doesn't like break the connection between the pigment particles and the binder, because it's basically like having an extra binder, which is the substance that holds, holds the paint together. So now once I've got a couple of these out, I'm using some Turner's yellow, which is one of my favorite yellows. And I also think about a mixture of colors that might be transparent and like this Indian yellow is transparent and colors that are more opaque. So anything that's um, like a cadmium color is more opaque. And then this Viridian is gonna be more transparent and that's a type of a green. And sometimes it's nice to be able to mix opaque things and transparent things, especially if you're thinking about layering up colors. So I start out always with some gestural marks. So I've got my 
paper towels next to me and I've got a bucket of water over here, which I don't think you guys can see. But I start with um, some of the medium and then thinking about this being a seascape, I'm just gonna imagine that there might be some water here and just start laying out big gestural marks so that you can kind of lay out your vision of where things will be. And then I also think these marks are nice to kind of work from as you think about where your shoreline is, where the land might be. So maybe then if I think of that is my vantage point being around here, then I'll think of where the, where maybe the land is over here. And then more of maybe a bright yellow for some sun up here. And these are kind of just loose moments that don't really have to be perfect. And a lot of this gets covered up in the end anyway. And if I think of this going back to a blue sky over here above the water, that's kind of how I start most things. And for me, I like having this sort of base to react to as I go along rather than just the white. The white can be kind of intimidating. So then after this, I'll look for a brush that might be a bit smaller. I like this one, the shape. It's called a filbert brush and I like that curve. Um, so then I start thinking about what sort of um, land, things might be on the landscape. And I just start painting some of these organic forms that I find kind of interesting. Like I said, I pull a lot of things out of books and I just look at a lot of visual references from books to things I find online. Um, and I kind of start blocking it out and thinking about what might be growing on the shoreline, what sort of shapes they might be creating. And if your paper pops up like mine is doing here, you can either ignore it or you can kind of pull it up off the taped corners and then flatten it back out again. Because sometimes your paper will buckle as you're going along and it's not a big deal. You can just fix that. So right now I'm keeping everything to these kind of blues for my outlines and my planning of my plants, but you can use any color that you like. And these are trees that have been working into my paintings lately. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but they're called Sigillara trees and they lived like 250 million years ago. We know about them through fossils. And I think that they make these kind of interesting shapes. They kind of exploded at the top and they had these very long trunks on them. So I block in a few of those over there. And then if I think of this as a sea, I might think about ships sailing, just thinking about the, the sails that, and the shapes that the sails might make if there were some in the background. Some more plants. There's kind of no wrong or right way to do any of this either. It's all just however your instinct moves you. And then when I get to about this point, I might just stop and start thinking about color and what sort of colors I wanna work into some of these um, shapes. So if I think, so 
that I might like a bit of yellow down here. Um, I'll mix up maybe something that has a transparent yellow like the Indian yellow and start with that. And as you can see, that lets some of the background um, sort of shapes come through. And you can also turn your brush around and scratch into it like I just did. And if I wanted something to be more strongly yellow or I don't want you to see the background through it, that's when I'll start using that on top. And you can just kind of go back and forth like this for a while in certain colors, thinking about a leaf and that middle kind of a line that runs down a leaf. And then I think of this as like a kind of a curling or I found the, this image of um, a plant that is extinct that doesn't exist anymore. And it kind of had this curling quality to it and it looked like it kind of made like a cup. And they think it was shaped like that as many things today are also shaped like that to help funnel uh, water down into the earth. And so I tend to include that in a lot of my paintings also. And then you can change your shape of your brush. So if I'm using something where I want like a stronger mark, this is a, a, a kind of a shape that's nicer to draw with. And And now I start thinking about what colors I like to put next to each other. Like I like the yellow and the pink and I like what it does. You know, there's a whole color theory about how you see colors very differently next to each other than you do when they're alone or next to other colors, how it literally, your mind sees them completely differently. There's an artist named Joseph Albers who did all sorts of amazing paintings putting colors together in relationship to each other. And you'd think that they were completely different colors, but actually they were often the same color, just um, next to something else that made it look completely different. So I like to think about things like that also. And if you make a very wet mark like that, the other thing that I like to do so you can take your kitchen roll and you can lay it on top and press it down. And especially if it has a pattern itself, you'll pull off the paint and you'll leave the pattern from the kitchen roll on your painting. So I tend to shop for kitchen roll that has all different patterns on it so that I can leave different textures and things behind. I don't know if you can tell that, but the impression from this towel here has got this very architectural solid texture to it and the other one is lighter and more swirly. And then oh, I forgot to put some white. White's really important. As you can see, it's so important to have a huge bottle of white. Um, because that lets you take your colors and make all sorts of different ones really easily. So if I like this color, but I want to have something a little bit contrasting to it, but I don't want to go into some other color completely, then what I can do is just mix in a bit of white. And then you have something that will always look great together because it is the same color. And you can see that when you scratch into it too, you can still bring up that bottom layer, which is kind of the beauty of actually also working on paper. I really like the effects that you can get. So Rebecca, just to let you know, we're about halfway through today's workshop and just to give everyone a kind of time indication as well. Um, if you'd like to use the Q&A function to ask Rebecca a question, we'd like to really encourage and invite you to do so. 
Um, I'd like to take this moment to just say a big hello to Queen Mary's Lavender Ward, who are joining us today. Yeah, please feel free and ask any questions. I'm doing a bit of green here for this leaf, which I imagine being this kind of a giant sheltering shape that kind of curls around. And in my mind, this is the front side of it. And I'm gonna make what's on the front that should be closer to us or the first thing we see, maybe a little bit darker green. And for this, I mixed up a transparent yellow, the Indian yellow, and some of the brilliant blue, brilliant light blue, which is a great color. I also think it's nice when you think of um, paintings that incorporate colors that are quieter, like this green, with something that's more bold. So those are the other sorts of color things that I think about. And in making different kinds of marks, marks like this that are really fine and delicate where I'm just using the side of the brush, almost like a pencil. And then you can also create some patterns. So for this one, I will make this kind of like an orangey color. So Rebecca, we've had quite a few questions come in um, just about the type of paper that you're using. Could you please give us a, a recap um, of the kind of paper that you're using today? Yeah, this is just, it's actually designed to be used for oils or acrylic. So you can buy paper in the art store that you can use watercolor on, or you can use acrylic on, or you can use oil on. This one in particular lets you use um, oil or acrylic, but for example, you wouldn't use watercolor with this. And that's because this is set up in such a way that it can take the amount of um, thickness of paint of different mediums. And so it's got like a certain level of, I guess, durability to it. And other, and a watercolor paper wouldn't be the right choice for this. So that, that's why I'm using this one. And then I also think of like, who lives in the sea? I think about, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie that my octopus teacher, but I absolutely loved that movie it's on Netflix right now. And I think of it's this guy who met an octopus. And so I have been painting these kind of obscure references to sea creatures in my landscapes as well. And this is, uh, kind of my, my, my reference for how I think how my experience floating around in Lake Michigan as a kid growing up and as an adult now when I get to go back home. We'd just like to say a big hello to everyone joining us from PQ in Hull. A huge hello again to Monmouth School for Boys. They're really enjoying the workshop today. And a really extra big hello to everyone joining us in Rookery Gardens in Birmingham. So then I'll go back over here and think about the trees again. And they have these kind of, are almost like um, very delicate growth at the top for, the, for how they looked on the, um, the stem itself. So these had um, the trunks of these trees, they were really tall and really kind of barren, or at least based on what I've read so far, I'm no expert, but What's interesting about them is they had this kind of almost reptilian kind of leopard-like pattern all the way up the trunks. So I think that they provide a nice opportunity to think about what was here before us and how different things are kind of how similar.
And trees can also just be kind of sketchy things that you put in. I mean, anything you do can just be done loosely like this. And just putting one light color over another gives you kind of a feeling of texture and distance. And now I'm using a bit of the Turner's yellow that I mentioned that I liked so much. This is another plant that I found that had this kind of a pod-like shape to it. So if you leave this dry too long, the scratchiness doesn't really work as well. So you can either choose to add more layers in a slightly different color over something you've already done. And then if you want to draw into that, it starts to show up again. And I think adding all those different kinds of textures are a really nice way to experiment with painting. Rebecca, we've had a question come through about the brand of paint that you're using. Can you let us know which paints you're using? Yes, I am really lucky. I'm using all um, Liquitex paints. And Liquitex is uh, a really amazing supporter of hospital rooms as well. So they've donated um, all the paints that I'm using today. So I feel really lucky. And they're really, um, really strong pigments. So it lets you do a lot of um, fun things with paint very easily. So I'm very lucky. And it's uh, the pouring medium that I mentioned earlier is also um, from Liquitex. They do a whole range of mediums and they do all different kinds of paints actually. I'm using all of what's called a soft body paint, which means it's really fluid like this because I like to make marks that are really, um, easy to make and very kind of relaxing, so to speak. But they, there's other types of formulations of acrylic paint you can use. If you like something really thick, um, they also have something called heavy body paint. And that's really nice if that's the kind of marks you like making. I prefer this one because I like how you can add things to it to make it thicker if you want, or just paint with it more thickly. And it works really beautifully either way. So that's the formula I'm using today. Rebecca, could you talk us through some of your favorite trees and fossils and kind of fantastical things that you particularly love to paint or inspire you? Well, what's funny is I, um, I look at all sorts of, lately I've been looking at tropical things, probably because I'm freezing in London, and um, thinking about what, uh, how, how like tropical environments create such colorful, really amazing, beautiful um, sorts of plants. So I've been looking a lot at, at mostly places I've never been before, um, everywhere from, you know, uh, places like, um, Oh, the name of the island is escaping me now. But I look at different references, different islands, different exotic um, locations. I also look at, like I mentioned earlier, um, the mushrooms from Illinois, because that's where I'm from. And I, I, everything that it's more for me, it's like, it's the shape of things and how they might look and the colors that I'm looking for. And the things I also find interesting, like one of the hospital rooms projects I did, um, the whole work referenced a place called Shingle Street Beach. And what I really found interesting about that is they had the sea cabbage, which is really um, unique to that area and only thrives in a few places in the world. And I like, and it grows in these pebbles, like from nothing. So I was kind of fascinated by the shapes of the leaves of the sea cabbage. And so something like that might just weigh on my mind and crop up a lot in different, in different ways and in different paintings. But there's nothing really like, yeah, I'm sentimental. So things from home, although Illinois is not known for its fabulous flora and fauna. <laughs> but I just find the things that I find interesting are the story of maybe um, like these plants that fed water into the earth and, and how our relationship with the land. I absolutely, I, I've 
born and raised always in an urban environment. I've never even lived in a suburb of any city. And um, my mom and dad decided when I was a kid to get an organic farm, like just for them. And I hated every minute of it. And I could, I hated my weekends there because I just couldn't relate to this. And my mom and dad were so into organic farming and our relationship to the earth and land way before anyone else was thinking about this. And so it's kind of funny that this has come back around for me now. And now it's also what I look at. So they were ahead of their time. But I do think about, you know, our food sources and where things come from. And I listen to a lot of podcasts in the studio or, or Audible. Like I'm listening to um, Braiding Sweetgrass right now which one of the other artists who did a workshop was Elton. She recommended to me, and it's really, really a great uh, read about our relationship to the land and how we should have a respectful sort of um, dynamic and how the earth kind of takes care of us, providing us food and support. And it's really a great Then when I'm nearing the end of a piece of work, I think, oh, where would I want to add, add colors in to kind of create a balance so that your eye moves around and decisions like that aren't, um, you know, don't seem so important, but it is kind of nice to keep it in mind when you're working. Those kind of more formal thoughts of carrying someone's eye around a painting and how you would do that. We've had a really lovely comment come through, Rebecca. It's from an anonymous attendee, but they've said it's so lovely and therapeutic. Rebecca, your work is amazing. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. I find this really fun to be doing this with you guys today too. So I'm honored that you're here. So here I'm just thinking about how when you are near the sea or in a big lake like Michigan, you know, the water changes colors as you near the shore versus as you go further out. So sometimes it's just simple thoughts like that that make, make the, you know, make the paintings as I'm going along. So then it kind of gets to this point and you kind of look back and think like, okay, what would I want to add? Or do I not want to add anything else anymore? And how do I like where the different colors are? Should I take a bit of that color and add it over here again? Or do I like it as it is? And things kind of start to come together. Can see I'm, just, I'm not someone who mixes your colors very scientifically. And I also think about those original marks from the very beginning and leaving those behind so you can still see some of them in some places because I think that's kind of nice to see kind of like the journey of the painting from the very beginning. I used to have a set of rules for myself. I always left a bit of the bare paper somewhere visible in the painting. And then every stage, every moment you could still find somewhere. I'm not so disciplined about doing that anymore, but it is kind of a nice way to 
think when, and I, I only started painting later in life. So it's kind of almost nice to give yourself a set of rules that you think about like, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to always leave a bit of the paper white, or I'm going to not leave any of it white, or I'm going to start with these certain marks and keep using them throughout the work or any combination of it. And that kind of, sometimes that's all that you need to kind of give you a, a start or a way in. This shape I think of as just a giant leaf. So I might try to do things that emphasize that. So we've got a really incredible amount of people that have joined us for today's workshop. Just a reminder that we've got about 15 minutes left before the workshop ends. If you'd like to, us to give you kind of a shout out or a big hello, let us know in the Q&A where you're joining us from today. Rebecca, we've immediately got um, a lovely comment come through from Akshat Kumar, who says, Mav, your painting is so amazing. I'm really enjoying watching this. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so glad. So then at this point, I start to think of what sort of patterns and textures some of the plants might have too. And so if I haven't already included that in a way like I did here where I had some different patterns scratched in and different layers of color. When I have a flatter area, I might go back in with another color and create textures on top, thinking about, well, maybe this plant had a stripe to it. I think the thing that I've enjoyed about working with nature is the quantity of colors and texture and pattern. It's kind of got this very limitless possibility to it, which I think is what makes it kind of exciting. And I do this, uh, like I showed the watercolor sketches earlier, it's really nice to be able to um, work quickly on paper, even as part of my practice, even if those aren't the things that people ever really see, I think, experimenting like this with different textures and colors and lines and gestural marks um, that eventually does wind up feeding into the bigger paintings as well. And you can think of how you also hold your brush. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, I like this shape because you can make these flat marks with it and you can make something very thin. And you can work with it, you know, you can work with any brush more aggressively or you can have a light touch with it. So I also do kind of have those things in mind based on the marks I'm making based on the effect I wanna have. And there's nothing really, there's no wrong or right way to do anything. That's what I think is so great about painting actually. I used to work in sculpture. And if you made a mistake there when I was welding these giant structures, that was a bit more problematic. <laughs> With paint you can fix it a little bit more easily. So unsurprisingly, Rebecca, today we've got a really kind of global audience joining us for today's workshop. Firstly, I'd like to say a big hello to Jim Burley Unit at, at the Maudsley, and they're really enjoying the painting. La Villa says hello. Hi, La Villa. And um, we've also got people joining from Columbus, Ohio, USA, and Greenville in the USA as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Yeah, it's nice to have everyone from so many places. Hi, everybody. 
So then now I'm kind of going in and um, accenting areas that I want to kind of bring out or push back. So the darker the darker a color is, the more it will recede for you. So I think about where I would want something to recede, to kind of give it a sense of depth. So you feel like some parts are, oh, the sun's coming out of my painting. Um, so you feel like some parts are going moving away from you and other things are up close. And then I often, at the end, try to do things with this smaller brush, which some people might think of as more of a starting tool because it's got a very, you know, it's very easy to draw with clearly, but I like to use it um, at the end so that I don't pin myself down too much early on, but I might just go in and use it this way to give a little bit more depth to make things seem to add, add a little bit more delicate textures and things. So we've got a question come through, Rebecca, and it's just kind of, would you be able to repeat um, who your inspirations and references are for people that might have missed the beginning of the workshop? Yes, of course. Um, I like to look at, um, I've been looking at nature a lot lately. I've always been really interested in how important our environment is to us. And um, personally, I spent a lot of time in a hospital as a kid and I am the kind of institutional environments um, I think are were challenging. So for me, it's so important that there is beauty around us. So I started looking a lot at interiors and then recently looking at nature. And I think that's probably to do with, you know, this time, these particular times that we're living in. So I'm thinking more about nature and our relationship to the planet and how human beings are affecting the environment. So I look at extinct plants things that don't exist anymore, like these trees that I put in the background here. Um, I think about things that do exist, like octopuses in the sea and sailboats and different leaves and organic flowery things in pods. And I kind of put it all together with things that I just make up out of the top of my head as well. And all of that together kind of becomes the painting. So things that are still alive today things that don't exist anymore, and things that I just make up. So it kind of runs the gamut. And I'm really into this weird pink, so I'm gonna put more of this out. This is called Light Portrait Pink. And it's a kind of a, an interesting color and it mixes in really well with other things as well. So if I want to make something kind of come out, this is a color I often go to. And like I mentioned earlier, today I was thinking about a landscape and a seascape kind of at the same time as a shoreline. And maybe thinking about how I'm from this perspective looking up at the shoreline from the water. Just to give everyone kind of an indication of where we are with time, we're drawing into kind of the last five minutes of the workshop now. And um, hopefully you've been able to either watch along and just kind of enjoy and relax. Um, and it's a been a wonderful experience. Or you might have created an artwork as well. We'd absolutely love to see them. If you'd like to upload those to our gallery on website, hospital-rooms.com. Yeah, I'd love to see what everyone makes today. I think painting should be really um, 
well when it's coming easily and when you're doing something like this it should be something that hopefully does make you feel relaxed and i hope that you guys are feeling that way too So for the last few minutes, I'm just thinking, as I mentioned earlier, about what colors I still wanna add in or emphasize and what sort of shade I want them to be. Do I want them to be a darker color? And then this is a good example of how you can paint a dark color down. And the beauty of working with acrylics is it dries quickly. And then you can put a light color on top, leaving the edges of the first mark still there so you can make marks out of layering different colors on top of each other and you can go back in and emphasize things as well so we've had we've had two questions come through rebecca just before we kind of draw to the end of our workshop mm -hmm. um, the first is a question from susan hodgson and susan asks um we don't need to let the paint dry underneath all the layers you don't have to, but if it's not dry and you put it on, um, you can pull up the bottom color and, and then it becomes added to what you wanted to put down. If you don't mind that, which I often don't mind, then that's great. But if you really want that sharp distinction, let it go for maybe like 15 or 20 minutes and then you can go back over it and you won't have that mixed mixing of the colors. But you can totally do that. And you can also still do it if it's wet underneath if you paint it on very delicately with a really light touch, you won't pull up very much, but you have to kind of hold your brush really lightly in your hand and just kind of lay the color down as opposed to really drawing with it, for example, like I just did there. Brilliant, thank you, Rebecca. And just final question as we kind of draw to an end is from Laura. Um, and it's just kind of, could you give us a recap on the name of the ink that you were using? Yes, I actually wound up not using ink on this, but often ink is what I would use on the bottom. And I use Liquitex ink as well. And the difference is it's an acrylic ink. So just like with paint, I mix it up in my paintings a lot. And because it's acrylic, it means it's actually got pigment in it, it's not dye. So it will last forever and you can mix it in with the paintings and there's no reason, um, no like contraindication of the two things working together. Um, so I use acrylic inks and I use them in this kind of washy way as I did with the paint today. Um, and they're, and they're also really nice to layer up together. And then if you mix them with pouring medium, you can get these really great drippy, swipey sorts of, uh, effects with them. Like this kind of stuff up here that you can see, and they're really, really beautiful. Fantastic. That feels kind of a really nice place to wrap up today's workshop with Rebecca Byrne. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Rebecca on behalf of Hospital Rooms. Um, it's been a really lovely workshop today and we've really appreciated your time. Thank you again to our friends at Anthropology EU for your generous support of today's workshop. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you to everyone that submitted a question today and let us know where you've been joining us from. It's been brilliant to have you all with us. It's now time to launch our end of workshop poll. If you could indicate how you found the workshop today, that will really help us to improve the digital art school as we continue to grow our programme. That should be appearing on your screens now. And I'll just give you a few moments to answer that. Thanks everyone who's answering. We'll just give that another few seconds. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm just going to end that poll now. Richard, if you could please bring back our slideshow, that would be brilliant. Thank you. 
A big thank you once again to everyone for joining us today. It's been a really brilliant workshop creating fantastical landscapes with Rebecca, and we hope that you all get to continue the great work this afternoon. If you're still here with us, I'd like to share the story of hospital rooms and how the workshop today has come about. We are a London-based arts and mental health charity, and we transform inpatient mental health units with extraordinary art. We began the digital art school in response to COVID-19 lockdowns when our in-person work in units was put on hold. It's been hugely important for us to build a wonderful creative community where we can join together and feel part of something special. And we are now an award-winning programme. You can find the library of our past projects and all of the previous digital art school workshops on our YouTube channel, where you'll find a variety of original workshops with world-class artists. Please do have a look and subscribe. We're always uploading new videos. We also have a digital art school newsletter, which keeps you informed of upcoming workshops, the materials you'll need, along with any relevant downloads and links to last week's video. You can sign up for that at hospital-rooms.com. We'd absolutely love for you to share your artworks with us from any of our, of our digital art school workshops by uploading to our online gallery. We love seeing the works you've created and we do share your work with our artists. You can do so anonymously or you can let us know your name and where you are. If you've created a fantastical landscape today, either joining us live or watching back on demand, we'd absolutely love to see them. We will be back next week on Thursday the 3rd of June with Sharon Walters for the first of three workshops where we will be creating identity portraits. This is another workshop supported by our friends at Anthropology EU and we'd really love to see you all for that. Please make sure to register on our website and via Eventbrite if joining in through Anthro events. From me and everyone at Hospital Rooms today, thank you all again so much for joining us and a huge thank you once again to Rebecca for leading today's wonderful workshop. We'll see you all again at 2 p.m. next week, Thursday. Thank you.